Good morning. Let's, uh, let's sing about the greatness of our God. <clears throat> Light of the world, you step down into darkness. Open my eyes, let me see. Beauty that made this heart adore you. Hope of a life spent with you. Here I am to worship, here I am to bow down, here I am to say that you're my God. You're altogether lovely, altogether worthy, altogether wonderful to me. King of all days, all so highly exalted, glorious in heaven above. Humbly you came to the earth you created, all for our sake became poor. Here I am to worship, here I am to bow down, here I am to say that you're my God. You're altogether lovely, altogether worthy, altogether wonderful to me. Here I am to worship, here I am to bow down, here I am to say that you're my God. You're altogether lovely, altogether worthy, altogether wonderful to me. Beauty that made this heart adore you, hope of a life spent with you. Hey, good morning, everyone. Great to see you. We want to welcome everyone, our guests, those who will be listening online now or later on, as well as those that might be out in the parking lot, too. We just want to remind you to please refer to uh, your bulletin for important announcements and prayer requests. And our announcements for today, we do have Life Group, and we're excited about that. The lessons are back on the counter there, so if you need one of those, Grab one of those, and then there will be a teen devotional on the 13th of February, and they've got more information on that coming soon. And the Montana State Lectureship is the 25th through the 27th of February, and please register on the Billings Church website if you plan to attend. also want to keep Bev Tuttle's friend, Bonnie, in our prayers. She had a brain tumor removed. She's uh, hanging in there, but she also does have dementia and COVID, so keep her in your prayers. Vani is her name. We'll go ahead and uh, have our opening prayer at this time. Bow with me, please. Gracious Heavenly Father, we're so very thankful that we're here this morning. We ask that you open our minds as we're taught your word today that it can be, we can learn more about your word and how to serve you. Father, we ask that you be with Matt and, uh, and Scott and those who are teaching today. And Father, we also ask that for those who are sick and in need, that you will meet their needs, Father, as we pray for their healing. Father, as we continue to go and to bless you in our lives, we ask that you give us the strength to continue to continue working towards you. Um, great commission, Father, by trying to reach all those who are lost, all those who are, uh, need your, the relationship that we have with you. We pray, Father, that as your son also worked with you, that we can also have a strong relationship as we become closer and closer to Christ. And we pray this all in your son's name. Amen. Let's stand for this song, if you're able to, please. And then after we sing this song together, we'll share in the Lord's Supper. 
Man of sorrows, what a name for the Son of God who came, ruined sinners to reclaim. Alleluia, what a Savior, bearing shame and scoffing rude in my place condemned he stood, sealed my pardon with his blood. Hallelujah, what a Savior. Guilty, vile, and helpless, we spotless Lamb of God was he. Full atonement, can it be? Hallelujah, what a Savior. Lifted up was he to die. It is finished, was his cry. Now in heaven a Exalted high, hallelujah, what a Savior. When he comes, our glorious King, all his ransomed home to bring, then anew this song we'll sing, hallelujah. What a Savior. Please be seated. Awesome. Good morning. Um, I'll be reading out of 1 John chapter 1 here in just a second. Awesome. Um, so I had a lot on my mind this week, and I still kind of struggled to scribble something down to say this morning. But what I came back to, um, and what I kept thinking about this week a little bit, was stories. And how some of the characters in our modern stories are, just seem to be really confused people. And it seems like less and less frequently at the end of some of the more modern uh, books and TV shows and movies and those sort of things, there doesn't seem to be a resolution a lot of times to the the conflict in some of these folks, and you can definitely disagree with me on that. It's just kind of a, an observation of mine. Um, but I do think there is a, a void of kind of more heroic people uh, to look at in our, in our current society and pop culture. Um, and, you know, not necessarily that it's bad to, you know, always learn about conflicted people because we're imperfect too, right? Um, but I think it really begs something, something interesting here uh, from the Apostle John. In 1 John chapter 1, verses 5 through 6, this is the message we have heard from him and declare to you. God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. Jesus' story is by far the most important one to remember. And he's by far the most important character to remember um, and use to guide our lives. His story is one of sacrifice, uh, truth, and direction for us. Um, so let's take a moment to, to remember him this morning and hopefully carry that with us uh, this week as well. So let's pray for the bread. Let's pray. My Lord, my God, I thank you so much for basically just giving us command to think of your son and the great sacrifice he made every every Sunday morning for keeping that in our program and keeping that uh, up front in our minds. Lord, we thank you that he died on that cross, that he became the final sacrifice for us. Uh, just help us to take this bread in a humble manner, always remembering him. Thank you for your sons. In his name we pray. Amen.
Let's pray for the cup. Father in heaven, we are so grateful that you sent your son to die for each and every one of us. Father, we know he was the unblemished lamb that was sacrificed, and his blood was shed for each and every one of us. Father, let us always remember that sacrifice, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We'll now have a prayer for the offering. If you're a guest, uh, don't feel obligated to give. Let's pray. Dear righteous and most heavenly Father, we want to come before you now, and we just want to say thank you, and we ask that you use this and towards it, your God's kingdom, and that we will continue to be a blessing in you. In Christ's your name we pray. Amen. Let's stand for this song as well, please. And after this, after we sing this together, we'll hear from Matt, and he'll be using God's word, I have no doubt. Encamped along the hills of light, ye Christian soldiers rise, and press the battle ere the night shall veil the glowing skies. Against the foe in veils below, let all our strength be hurled. Faith is the victory we know that overcomes the world. Faith is the victory, faith is the victory. Oh, glorious victory that overcomes the world. His <clears throat> our sword, the word of God. We tread the road, the saints above. Shouts of triumph trod. By faith they like a whirlwind's breath swept on o'er every field. The faith by which they conquered death is still our shining shield. Faith is a victory, faith is a victory. 
O glorious victory that overcomes the world. On every hand the foe we find drawn up in dread array. Let tents of ease be left behind and onward to the fray. Salvation's helmet on each head with truth all girt about. The earth shall tremble neath our tread and echo with our shout. Faith is the victory, faith is the victory. Oh, glorious victory that overcomes the world. To him that overcomes the foe, white raiment shall be given. Before the angels he shall know his name confessed in heaven. Then onward from the hills of life, our hearts with love aflame, will vanquish all the hosts of night in Jesus' conquering name. Faith is the victory, faith is the victory. Oh, glorious victory that overcomes the world. Please be seated. Good morning. It's good to see you again on another Sunday when we can come together and worship our Lord. I want to say thanks to those who have been serving this morning uh, for the prayers that have been led, uh, for the, the folks that served on the table. Robert, thanks for the reminder of Jesus, uh, the hero of our soul. I really appreciate that reminder. Thanks to Brittany and Diego. Uh, we really don't say thank you to them enough, in my opinion. I don't say thank you to them enough, in my opinion, uh, because they're making it possible for those who may be in our parking lot, those who may be on Facebook, to join us and and so we welcome all of you who may be joining us that way. And Brittany and Diego, thank you for making that possible. Let's begin with a prayer before we jump into God's Word. Father, as we come to you this morning, I pray that you would help us to empty ourselves just as you emptied yourself. I pray that you would help us to lay aside our false self the self that, that causes us to try to be our own God and to do life without you. Instead, Lord, laying that aside, I pray that you would renew our minds this morning. I pray that you would stir in our hearts this morning. And I pray that by the power of your Spirit and the power of your Word, you would help us to put on the new self, the self created after the righteousness of God and true righteousness and holiness. Father, help us to be like you and be more like you because of what we do with what we hear this morning. Father, I pray that you will be present. More importantly, I pray that you will help us to be open to your presence as you've promised to meet us every time we gather in your name. Father, draw us closer to you. Draw us deeper into your life. And I pray that you will, uh, you will help us to honor you with the life you've given us. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. As we begin this morning, we're continuing in 1 Peter. And when I stopped last time, I, I was encouraging us to turn on the light. To turn on the light of hope. To make the decision that regardless of what's going on in life, that we're going to make a decision to hope or to, to turn on the light. And you might have left that sermon wondering, and I think it would be good if you did, how exactly do I do that? This morning you might think of this lesson as turn on the light part two. Because what I want to begin with is addressing the question, how do we turn on the light? In the end of that section that we read last week, Peter talks about the word of God. And he, he says that the word is the good news that was preached to you. And as he begins in chapter 2 verses 1 through 3... Continuing that thought, he answers our question, just how is it that we turn on the light? Read with me beginning at chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. Peter says, since the word is the good news that was preached to you, put away all malice 
and all deceit and hypocrisy and slander, envy, envy and slander. Like newborn infants, long for the pure milk of the word that by it you may grow up into salvation if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. And there's our answer. Because you see, when Peter talks about growing up into salvation, what he's talking about there is another way of describing holiness. Holiness is how we grow up into our salvation. We become the reality that that Jesus died to bring about. And so if growing up into the Word is another way of talking about holiness, and Peter says the way we do that is longing for the pure milk of the Word, then the Word is the way that we turn the light on in our lives. The Word is how we get the light on. So taking in and reflecting on the Word of God consistently helps us turn the light on when we're in the dark. And yet sometimes that's hard to do, isn't it? Sometimes that is very, very hard. (laughs) Very, very hard to do. Peter's audience, the ones that he's telling to take in the Word, to turn on the light, they're exiles. They're outcasts. Their society has has taken them, and if you want to think of it this way, it's like they've taken these people and thrown them aside into the local trash dump. It isn't hard to imagine that their new social location, their loss of standing, and the worldly stinking thinking that threw them out on that trash dump, it's not hard to imagine that that has made it very difficult for them to take in and reflect on the Word. Think about your own life. Think about the times in your life when you look around and all you see is trash. And you feel like you've been thrown out on the dump. It's hard to reflect on the Word in those times, isn't it? I recently came across a story that reminds me of Peter's audience and some of their troubles. I'm reading a book for school right now called Uncommon Ground. And the book is talking about how we as Christians can bridge the gaps that the polarization has created in our culture, where we've got people on one extreme and on the other. And in Uncommon Ground, Tish Harrison Warren tells about a conflict that she and others faced during her her time in grad school at Vanderbilt University when she was serving as a campus ministry leader in, in one of the ministries there. In 2010, a student had alleged that his Christian fraternity had kicked him out of it because he was gay. Now, I don't know if that's true or not, but that allegation led Vanderbilt to take a very swift and very hard response. And they said that if if you're going to use your beliefs to discriminate, then no society on campus, no club on campus, can have any belief standards required for membership, or for leadership. In other words, all those standards had to go. Warren's group had a simple requirement, not many, but they had one they would not budge on. They said, we want our Bible study leaders to agree that Jesus Christ rose from the dead bodily. And they wouldn't budge on that. And that created a problem, you see, because if Vanderbilt's saying, hey, you can't have any belief standards, then requiring leaders to believe in the resurrection of Jesus violates Vanderbilt's response. And so this campus ministry that Miss Warren was a part of was told that her ministry group's status as a campus ministry was now in question. The conflict quickly escalated, as so many things do these days. National media began to pick this story up. And as this story was reported, it was told from many different angles and for many, many different purposes. Warren says that her group began to realize, and I quote, If we did not tell our own story, our story would be told for us. And it would be misrepresented in half-truths and culture war outrage. So they began writing. This campus ministry, rather than retreating into the polarization, they engaged it. She says they began writing, making the case for preserving a diversity of viewpoints and ideas on campus instead of flattening differences by stamping out creeds in religious communities. And still, despite that effort to engage, and engage in a Christ-like way, throughout that 2011 school year, the campus ministry's status was constantly in flux. 
She says that the policy kept changing. We were on probation. Then we were told we were no longer on probation. Our hopes would rise after a good meeting with administrator. And then two weeks later we would read in the news that the administration had doubled down on the policy. In the end, we were kicked off campus with 14 other religious organizations which collectively represented nearly 1,400 students. They were taken, if you want to think of it this way, from the middle of their society, Vanderbilt University's campus, and it's like they were just thrown out on the trash, to the dump. And what I want you to think about is imagine that you're in one of those small groups that's coming together during that 2011 school year. You're part of a Bible study group whose purpose is to study the Bible to draw nearer to Christ. And so you come together as part of one of these Bible study groups. What do you think is on everybody's mind in that 2011 school year? What do you think everyone who comes together for one of those Bible study groups actually wants to talk about instead? And how do you think that impacted their purpose as a Bible study group and their mission to to reach others for Jesus? I share that story because what I think it illustrates is that when life takes us and throws us out on the dump, it can sometimes kill our appetite for the Word of God. And yet, says Peter, the Word is the very thing that we need most when we're in the dump. The light of the Word is what we need most when life throws us out like yesterday's trash. Peter describes this in chapter 2, verses 4 through 10. And I want you to read with me and notice the difference that Peter says the Word makes when life takes us and throws us out like trash. Peter says, as you come to Him, to Jesus... A living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God chosen and precious? You yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to offer spiritual sacrifices to God, acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in Scripture, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone, chosen and precious, and whoever believes in Him will not be put to shame. So the honor, the honor is for you who believe. But for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone, and a stumbling rock, a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies, the praiseworthy deeds of the one who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Did you notice the difference that the Word makes when we engage it, especially when life throws us out? Let me walk you through this. As Peter writes these verses, which I think are powerful, Peter writes with some scripture in mind. In verse 6, he has Isaiah 28, 16 in mind. He quotes it. In verse 7, he has Psalm 118.22 in mind. And then in verse 8, he has Isaiah 8 verse 14 in mind. And I want to point this out, pause for just a second from my sermon and go off script. I want you to notice that Peter can recall these scriptures because he's previously put them in his heart. There is a place for us to memorize scripture. Because when we're in the dump... You just give the Holy Spirit one more tool to pull and to use in your heart to help you through. Peter can pull these scriptures because he's had them in his heart for a very long time, it would seem. And I want you to notice what he's doing with scripture. Did you catch that? My favorite way of thinking of it is it's kind of like Peter has the word of God in one hand 
And he has the experience of these believers in the other. And what I see Peter doing in verses 4 through 10 is he's taking this hand that has the Word of God in it and he's taking this hand that has the experience of being thrown out like trash and he brings them together in what I would call a prayerful reflection. Word, experience, joined together in a prayerful reflection. And I want you to notice the difference that that makes when they do that. Watch what happens. As Peter does this, verse 4, he says, As you come to him, to Jesus, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God chosen and precious, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. When Peter brings together the experience, the, the word, and their experience and that prayerful reflection, what happens is the light of the Word shines in a way that illuminates experience. And all of a sudden they begin seeing things in this present experience that they previously would have missed. Let me give you three examples of what they're going to see if they bring the Word and experience together. Number one, what they're going to see is that we're not the only ones to experience this kind of rejection. I think that's one of Satan's most insidious lies. Is that when we get thrown out like trash, when we're going through suffering, Satan can somehow convince us that we're in it and we're the only ones. But if they bring the Word and Scripture together, the light of Scripture shines and exposes that lie for what it is. You see, what's happening here is Peter says, as you come to Him, Jesus. And what they realize is they're not the only ones that have experienced that rejection because Jesus Himself experienced being rejected by men even though He was chosen and precious in the sight of God. They realize they aren't the only ones. and That's a, that's a big realization for them. But they also realize... Moving a little bit farther, they realize that there's now a new reality. A new reality. What they're going through is not the only thing that's going on. God is doing something more. They realize that Jesus was rejected by men, but being rejected by men did not make Jesus any less chosen and precious. And so here's this new reality that Peter introduces. It's possible that what our culture is saying about us ain't true. It's possible that we're not as bad as they think we are. It's possible that even though they're rejecting us, Peter says, God sees things differently. We're chosen and precious, even at the same time that the world says we're trash. And this leads to, I think, a third possibility. As they begin to put the word and experience together, Peter's audience begins to see what God is actually doing in the dump. Look at verse 6 and read it with me, please. This is where Peter quotes Isaiah 28, 16. He says, Behold, I am laying in Zion. And that's present tense, by the way. I am laying in Zion... A stone, a cornerstone, chosen and precious. And whoever believes in Him will not be put to shame. Peter says, Jesus, who was rejected but was chosen by God, Jesus is a cornerstone. And some of you say, well, what in the world is a cornerstone? What does this mean? A cornerstone, as I learned this week, is the stone in a new building laid first with great care so as to ensure a straight and level foundation. So, Jesus is that cornerstone. And it's being laid, Peter says, in the midst of all of this rejection that they're experiencing. God has taken Jesus, as it were, that cornerstone, and He has set that cornerstone right down in the middle of the dump. Now ponder that. Jesus has taken, God has taken Jesus, the cornerstone, and he set him right down in the middle of where Peter's readers find themselves. Right in the middle 
of the stinking dump. But Peter goes just a little bit farther. It's not just about what God is doing with Jesus. Peter says, you yourselves, like living stones, like little Jesuses, are being built up as a spiritual house. And I want to pause here and point something out. Peter doesn't say spiritual houses. You were never meant to host God's presence as an individual. We were never meant to be individual spiritual houses. God says that you yourselves, like living stones, parts, are being joined together into a spiritual house, whole. So we experience the presence of God when we come together as a community. And if we're not experiencing the presence of God individually, it could be we're too isolated from the community. Think about that. Peter says, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. God is building something right in the middle of the dump, and he says that you and I are a key part of that plan. And that might not seem like much until you stop and realize that in this verse, Peter has just answered two of the questions that dog our heels when life brings us to the dump. We wonder, well, where is God when it hurts? What is God doing in the midst of this brokenness and the chaos? And Peter says, where is he? Well, he's right there in the dump and he's right there with you. And what is he doing? In the midst of all the brokenness and trash that we see in our world, God is building something. I remember when we were in Arkansas, we had been there two years, and we, we started thinking, you know, we, we really want to be in a house. We had been living in a rental for two years, and we made the decision to buy a house. And to me, it was just buying a house. But the church saw that very different, differently. What they saw is that Matt and Hannah, because they're buying a house... Matt and Hannah intend to stay, and we did, and we thought we would. When God says, I'm building something here, what God is saying is, I intend to stay with you. I don't intend to leave you. I'm building my place right in the middle of the dump where you find yourself. When you bring Scripture and experience together, The light of the word shines and we begin to see a new reality in our experience. We see God with us, working among us and through us, even when we're in the dump. We hear over the clamor of our culture and the clamor of our age, we hear God saying, you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession. And we know that all appearances to the contrary... God is taking what the world has discarded as trash. And in that very process, he's turning it into his treasure. It's a pretty glorious sight, isn't it? It is glorious what God is doing in the world right now. But I want to tell you something. If you try to see this by just looking at experience, you might as well be trying to clap with only one hand. You ever tried that? Go ahead, give it a try. Let's see how it works. I can't hear you. It doesn't work, does it? Here's a thought. I wonder when we're going through the trash, through the dump, maybe one reason that we fail to hear the applause of heaven is because we haven't brought in the other hand. The other hand that contains the Word of God which illuminates our experience. God's Word helps us in the dump because it's in, in its light we begin to see things that we would otherwise miss. So I prayed about this. An example came to mind that, uh, that I think illustrates exactly the principle that Peter is making. So I want to go back in history just a little bit. The date was September 16th, 1946. And on September 16th, 1946, a Christian high school, unlike any you've ever seen before, 
opened in Radville, Saskatchewan, Canada. Now I say unlike any you've ever seen before because Hannah and I for a while early in our marriage made a point to try to get to every Christian college campus and every Christian high school campus in the United States. And we got to quite a number of them just in, in some of our travels. And what we found is that almost all of those Christian colleges and campuses were, were pretty, pretty nice. They were fairly modern. But this school that opened in September of 1946 was different because only a road separated the campus of Radville Christian College from the city dump. Only a road. The school was not well known, not well known across Canada at that point anyway, not terribly well known across Montana, although it later would be. And so when people would ask, well, how do I get to Radville Christian College? The teacher of that school, a woman named Lillian Torkelson, she was fond of giving directions with a touch of humor. In her words, she would say, the road to our campus is really well marked. Turn right at the sign, cattle crossing. Turn right again at the sign, nuisance ground, half a mile east. And then turn right at the sign, no dumping here, and you are right at the campus of Radville Christian College. Just go to the dump, and you'll find Radville Christian College. Radville Christian College, you might say, was quite literally in a dump. Ms. Torkelson writes about that dump just to give us a little bit of uh, color for what we're experiencing, or what they were experiencing. She says that dump was a breeding spot for rats. It was a breeding spot for flies. And a horrible stench would sometimes cross our campus when the wind came out of the east. In the spring of 1947, I remember thinking wearily as I was crossing the campus hurriedly to escape the nauseating odor, must I endure this smell for the next 20 years? It was a dump. Eventually, the town eliminated the rats. A little bit later, they got rid of the odor, but still the stigma of being the school in a dump stuck. And locals called that school the mud rats. Sometimes they called them the river rats because they were up against a river. And yet, here's the yet God was doing something in that dump. God was at work in that dump. The students were coming and they were getting a normal education, the same kind of education that most Canadians were getting. But at the same time, they were also learning Scripture. Scripture was being taught. And as Scripture was being taught, lives were being shaped and were being made different. J.C. Bailey, the, the famous missionary to India, he points out that he noticed that difference mostly at hockey games. Anything about hockey games, what comes to mind? Fighting, yeah, fights and violence. And J.C. Bailey writes in one of his publications that last winter, just after our hockey team skated onto the ice, a coach for one of the other teams said to me, I did not know there were that many gentlemen left among young people today. God was at work in the dump, shaping his people, making them different. He continues, that same year, I once overheard this conversation between two men as our boys came onto the ice for another game. There will be no fighting in this game. The other man asked, how do you know? The first man replied, the Christian college is playing. Their lives were different because God was at work in the middle of that dump. And here's something more about that experience. That difference that God made in their lives made a difference in the lives of so many other people. In the 10 years that Radville Christian College was at Radville, 52 graduates received a diploma from that high school. But I want to point out two of them that have made a big impact on this congregation. Many of you have heard Scott talk about Walter Straker. Walter Straker was a graduate of Radville Christian College in 1953. As I've been working through uh, our history, preparing for next year, our 75th anniversary, I've been doing research on all that I can find out about the Church of Christ in Montana. And I ordered this yearbook of Church of Christ preachers that comes from 1982. In 1982... Walter Straker, who wasn't a minister, he was a supported elder, he is mentioned in that book and it says that he had been in Bozeman for 10 years. Seven of those as a supported elder. 
And in that 10 years, as at the date of publication, he had led 424 people to Jesus. 424 people to Jesus. How many people in Montana are Christians because of this man? How many people here learned to be evangelistic as a lifestyle because of this man? You see, you may not have known this man, whether or not you've known him. He's shaped your life because he's shaped the people that are shaping this congregation. And he was one of those that God was working on in the middle of that dump. Another one I think of is a man named Lynn Anderson. This one may be slightly less familiar to some of you. Lynn Anderson graduated from Radville in 1955. Recently I was reading a, a book about Church of Christ history. And one writer, Jack Reese, says that Lynn Anderson is the one through whose preaching the Church of Christ brought the Holy Spirit out of retirement. You've heard me talk about how the Holy Spirit was treated like a retired author. This guy says that Lynn Anderson was the one that began to change that. Lynn Anderson has made an impact on you, I know. And I can tell you that the organization through which I learned about Great Falls was started by Lynn Anderson. God was at work in the middle of that dump. And here's the thought I want to give you. That's just two of the 52. What if we talked about Shirley Lewis? What if we talked about how many others could we go through? What if we talked about the Knutsons? What if we talked about the Noyes family? Many of you are shaking your heads because you know these people. Or you know their, their family anyway. Whilst at Radville, if these people had looked around, they might have reasonably said, we're just in a dump. But if they had taken that experience, as I believe they did, and laid it aside scripture, what they would realize is that in the middle of that dump, you yourselves like living stones are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. God was there. He was at work. And He was making treasure out of what the world called trash. And here's the key point this morning. They might have missed it had they not brought in the Word of God. My simple message to you to us, to me, this morning, is that when we go through the dump, especially when the world has put us there, you and I need to make sure that we have both hands in play. We need to make sure that we look not just at our experience, as important as our experience is, we need to make sure that we also look at the Word. And we want to make sure that we bring the Word and our experience together in a kind of prayerful reflection. And so I encourage you this morning, if you don't have a daily practice of engaging the Word of God, today is a great day to start. Today is a great day to, to make sure that every day you're spending time reflecting on experience in the Word in prayer. It doesn't have to be a lot of Scripture, and it doesn't have to be a very long time. But the diff, the, the diff, goodness, the discipline of doing that will cultivate the vision that will enable us to see what God is doing even when they're dumped. And so, I'll end where I began. In 1 Peter 2, 1 through 3. So put away all malice, all deceit, hypocrisy, and envy, and all slander. Like newborn infants, long for the pure milk of the word, that by it you may grow up into salvation, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. This morning as we conclude, there may be someone here who needs to, to ask for prayer. Maybe you're in a dump and maybe you're not seeing the Lord. And maybe you need the encouragement of this body. If we can do that with you, we invite you to, to come on down and we'll pray with you and for you. And support you even after we, we leave here today. If there's someone here who's ready to become a Christian. To put Jesus on in baptism and begin living this amazing life participating in what God is doing to renew this world, if we can help you do that, we also invite you to come as together we stand as we sing. We are one in the Spirit. We are one in the Lord. We are one in the Spirit. We are one 
in the Lord, and we pray that all unity may one day be restored, and they'll know we are Christians by our love, by our love, yes, they'll know we are Christians by our love. We will walk with each other, we will walk hand in hand, we will walk with each other, we will walk hand in hand, and together we'll spread the news that God is in our land, and they'll know we are Christians by our love, by our love, yes, they'll know we are Christians by our love. All praise to the Father from whom all things come, and all praise to Christ Jesus, his only Son. And all praise to the Spirit who makes us one. And they'll know we are Christians by our love. By our love, yes, they'll know we are Christians by our love. Please be seated. We do have a couple of prayer requests this morning. We have one from Bob and Pam, and they want to lift up a praise to the Lord for the good news that they received at Pam's doctor appointment. So we want to praise God for that. And we also want to keep J.T. Lute in our prayers. Uh, J.T. is getting better, but he's still pretty weak, so let's continue to pray for J.T. as well. Let's pray together. Well, you are a great and awesome God. We thank you so much for giving us uh, so many spiritual resources like your word and community and just being able to reflect and to pray to you, Father. We uh, thank you so much for our relationship with you. It's so great to be your children and to know your love and your grace and your mercy to each and every one of us. Well, we do praise you for the good news that Bob and Pam received at her doctor appointment earlier this week. and. Father, we just uh, continue to uh, pray for JT, that you would strengthen him, Father, physically, spiritually, in every way. Father, we love you. We thank you so much for Jesus and pray all these things in his name. Amen. We'll now be led in our closing prayer, and after that, we'll uh, sing another short song, and then we'll be dismissed. Thank you, Matt, for today's lesson. It's amazing how much detail you put in them. Let's close. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for today's lesson. As we travel through our lives, we know that the path of Christianity is very narrow and can be very hard and trying at times. And there is so many times when we can make that left hand turn to the dump so easily. But with your love, guidance, and understanding, we can get through anything. Thank you for this beautiful weather. Thank you for all the people behind the scenes that make this happen for us. And may you watch over all of our travelers, the people that are sick, and the people that just need to come to you. Will you guide us and love us, protect us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. amen. <clears throat> you are the words and the music. You are the song that I sing. You are the melody. You are the harmony. Praise to your name I will bring. You are the Lord of Lords, you are the mighty God, you are the King of all kings. So now I give back to you the song that you gave to me, you are the song that I sing. God bless, have a great day.